grateful to have Dr. Richard Kunak, who has come to us from Boston University. I learned from him just a few moments ago that he's been there for 41 years. Um, loves his job. He's been researching Borneo, um, which is definitely on the top of my travel wish list. And is going to be talking to us tonight about climate change and the relation with Peru. Um, so we're going to hand it off to you, Richard. But you can see that even though we have 
very, very many years. If you look at the red here, which is the long-term running average, you can see that since the 19, in the 1850s and 60s when Thoreau lived, the temperature underwent a rise as we came out of the little ice age. And then it kind of reached a little bit of a plateau in the kind of 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then it's been on this rather steady rise since 1980. So the temperatures have risen by about 2 degrees centigrade, or about 4 degrees Fahrenheit, um, since Thoreau's time. And we're on this steady rise right now. We keep having record rate of warm years. So the most distinct effect of, effect of climate change is on the warming temperatures. But we also have changing rainfall patterns. And in many areas of the world, the temperatures, the, the climate is getting drier. But interestingly enough, in New England, it's getting wetter. So climate change is causing rainfall patterns to change, and we are getting somewhat wetter here. Also, another effect of climate change is on sea level rise. And it's absolutely clear that the sea levels are rising if we look at historical markers. In, in the New England region, the temperatures have already risen by about 8 inches, or the, the sea level has risen by about 8 inches since 100 years ago. So it's already risen by this much, which is just enough to kind of overtop sea walls and to flood in salt marshes. Uh, or flood in uh, freshwater marshes and really change the ecology of this region. And certainly around here, uh, in this region, along the coast of Maine, the sea levels are rising and they're coming into areas which were freshwater, making them brackish, going into brackish areas, and changing them into pure seawater. And it's also flooding into uh, areas, flooding into wells, and changing wells which used to be freshwater into brackish water. And it's estimated that by the end of this century, the sea levels will probably be about two to three feet higher than they presently are now, and they may be as much as six feet higher, which is going to have dramatic effects on the coastline and uh, you know, flooding many areas which are now above ground. And the other effect of, of, of climate change is to cause rising levels of carbon dioxide. And it's actually these rising levels of carbon dioxide which are causing the warming temperature. So it's all, as you all know, it's the burning of fossil fuels like oil, coal, and natural gas. And it's the cutting down of tropical rainforests which are causing these rising CO2 levels. And these rising CO2 levels act like blankets on the Earth, keeping the heat from the sun trapped in close to the Earth's surface. And so the more carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere, it's like adding extra blankets on your bed at night. So if you're used to sleeping with two blankets and feeling comfortable, and then you put a third blanket on your bed, then you get up at night feeling very warm. And if you put on like a fourth blanket on your bed at night, then you'll wake up in the night feeling like you're burning hot and you won't be able to sleep. And that's what we're doing for the Earth. We're putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is causing the Earth to warm up more than historical levels. And the reason that and this, these rising CO2 levels also have effects on plants directly. So plants need carbon dioxide. And so this is changing the whole ecology of our vegetation. So with rising CO2 levels, some plants can take in this vegetation better and become winners, and some species can't adapt to the CO2 and wind up losing. And also, since this is a coastal area, you probably also know that rising CO2 levels mean that there's more CO2 getting into the ocean, and it's causing the ocean to become more acidic, and this is really harming a lot of shellfish, which can't tolerate these higher acid levels. And so it's changing the whole ecology of the ocean. But what we're focusing on right now is the rising sea, the rising temperatures, and in particular the rising temperatures since the rose time. So besides the, the just the rising temperatures, we can see changing kind of effects in many ways in our uh, landscape. And one very dramatic effect of rising levels of temperature is the fact that we don't have as much snow cover during the winter. The snow often melts. Instead of getting snow, we get rain, freezing rains but also in terms of the melting time of, of ice uh, in the spring. And one of the most well-documented ponds in the United States is actually Walden Pond. And so Thoreau recorded in great detail when the ice melted every spring. And people have continued that. And in Thoreau's time, generally, the pond melted somewhere between mid-March and mid-April, but generally around April 1st on average. And now Walden Pond uh, melts around May, March 15th. So the melting time of the pond has shifted by about two weeks. And again, we have these documented melting times of ponds all over New England, and they're all shifting earlier because of warming temperatures. And this is also a global phenomenon of climate change. 
And this is a map showing what the effect of climate change is on agriculture around the world. And these areas which are shown in red are areas which are estimated to have a 20 to 50 percent decline in agricultural <coughs> yield by the middle of the century, in about 30 years' time. And you can see these whole areas, for example, of Brazil, uh, India, uh, Southeast Asia, Southern China, are estimated to have these very dramatic declines in agricultural yield by the end of the century. And those are places where we have huge concentrations of people. I mean, hundreds of millions of people live in those areas where the, the agricultural yields of things like rice and wheat and corn are going to be declining dramatically. And people in those areas are going to suffer from malnutrition, they're going to starve, and they're going to migrate away from those dry, hot areas. So this is really a global phenomenon, even though we're talking about New England. And then this is a map which is very important to me. So this is a map of Boston, showing what the effect of climate change is on the city of Boston, um, what the effect is of rising sea levels and climate change on the city of Boston. So this is downtown Boston right here, and this is where Boston University is right here, where I work. And this whole area is all the back bay and the fens. And you can see that this whole area is going to be underwater if Boston gets hit by a hurricane at high tide. So something like Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Sandy hit Boston at high tide, then the whole city will be underwater. And the city of Boston is one of the most, it's one of the most vulnerable cities in the world to rising sea levels because it's right at sea level and much of it is filled in marshland and, and uh, highland areas. And so Boston is very vulnerable. If Boston gets hit by a hurricane at high tide, it will cause tens of billions of dollars worth of damage to the city. And the only way out of this is to build a whole series of sea gates or sea walls to prevent this from happening. And this will happen throughout New England and throughout the region of areas. And so all the towns along the, the main coast here, again, are very vulnerable to this kind of effect here because with sea levels rising by three to six feet, uh, and with stronger hurricanes powered by warming temperatures, all of the cities along the coast of Maine are going to be vulnerable to this kind of damage. Okay, so our question as biologists is really about how has, how have the plants and animals, the biodiversity, been affected by climate change? And the second question that we have in our research is, why should we care about it? And I think a lot of you know about it, the reason that you're here today is because you care about nature, and we should care about it because a lot of the endangered species of our region will probably lose out if the climate changes. They won't be able to tolerate these changes. These changes will often favor invasive species. And as I walked around the property this afternoon, I noticed that you have many invasive species on your property. And these are the species which will generally be favored by warmer conditions and changing conditions. And also, it has a lot of impacts on agriculture, it has impacts on forestry, it has impacts on fisheries. For example, you know, very iconic species around here are lobsters. And as the temperatures get ever warmer, the lobsters have more difficulty surviving um, in this kind of climate. And then the third question is, what are we going to do about it? So we should document the reality of climate change and make this information available. But we also have to change society. So <laughs> We should be concerned about nature, but we also really have to change the attitude of the public and the government to try to deal with this very serious problem, which faces us directly, but also our children and grandchildren. So as biologists, if we're out looking for the effects of climate change, there's really a number of key indicators of climate change. So the, the probably the most obvious indicator of climate change is the technology of species, the timing of events, and I noticed that you're monitoring uh, phenology on the grounds here. You have people out here monitoring when plants are flowering and other interesting biological phenomena. And this is the single most important indicator of the effects of climate change. So when things happen in the spring, when birds arrive, when trees are leafing out, and also when things are happening in the autumn, so when birds leave, when the trees change color, when the fruits are maturing. So these are all things that people are doing now and people did in the past. The second indicator of climate change is on the distribution of species. So in particular, as the climate changes, we see a lot of birds and butterflies extending their range further north. 
And this is something that, that has been documented and that people are increasingly looking for as fingerprints of climate change. And then the third indicator is the abundance of species. So as the climate gets warmer, as the rainfall patterns change, some species are winners and some species are losers. So we can document how species are increasing in abundance or declining abundance and relate this to climate change. And the key approach in terms of doing this kind of work is to, I mean, you can start with looking at things in the modern time. You can start going and start looking at things today, which is what you're doing here, which is great. But an even more powerful approach is to find old records, find someone who did this in the past, and match it with current observations. And this is what we began doing starting in 2003. And after we've been looking for a while, as we've been kind of going to all these scientific meetings and making announcements of what we were looking for and going to libraries, someone told us that Thoreau had made very detailed observations of penology in the 1850s, and in particularly when plants were flowering in the spring in Concord. And we found that it was an independent Thoreau scholar who had asked just you know, every, everything that Thoreau had ever, had ever written. And we, so we wrote to this Thoreau scholar asking us if he knew about these records of Thoreau's and could we get a copy of them. And he said, he said sure, he had these copies of observations that Thoreau had made in the 1850s. And did we realize that they might be very important in climate change research? <laughs> so he had recognized himself that these would be very valuable to climate change research. And he was just waiting for someone to contact him. And uh, we were the ones who contacted him, and he sent us uh, these uh, records that Thoreau made. So these actually records were, were made in the 1850s. As you know, Thoreau lived in the 1840s on the edge of Walden. So he actually was living around Walden before he started making these genealogy records. And these are what his records look like. <laughs> and what we found is that his records were very useful as a realometer of climate change. So Thoreau liked to make up words, and one of the words he made up was the word realometer, so a reality meter. And so what we're doing is we're using his records as a reality meter for climate change. So his, his records here are in black, and my writings are in blue. So one thing you can see looking at his records is that, first of all, he has bad handwriting. Mm -hmm. so it's very difficult to read his handwriting. And this is one of his tables from 1857. This is a table from May of 1857. And these are the dates here, so May 14th, May 15th. And these are his records here. And these are all the plants that he first saw flowering in Concord on May 14th, 1857. And so if you read here, it says like high blueberry, which we now know would be high bush blueberry. But he writes here V vasilans. And here you have to be not only good at reading handwriting, but you also have to be a botanist to know that V. Vaseline stands for Vaccinium Vaseline or the low bush blueberry. And so it took actually a couple of years to actually decipher all of his handwriting to figure out what his names were. But eventually we had a great record of when plants were first flowering uh, in Concord during the 1850s. And so what we began doing starting in 2004 was to go out into Concord, Massachusetts and make the same observations that Thoreau made uh, in the same places. There was also another botanist named Alfred Hosmer, who from 1878 to 1902 also observed the first flowering time of plants in Concord uh, in, the same, in exactly the same way. So we started to go out and for plants like the Rhodora and the bristly locust, we started looking at all the plants in, in terms of when they first flowered in Concord, Massachusetts. And this is a summary of our results. So this is a summary of when plants were first flowering in Concord for 30 common spring wildflower species that Thoreau, Hosmer, and we saw in every year of our research. So if you look at Thoreau's years from here, right here. So these in blue, these are all of Thoreau's years, these are Hosmer's years, and these are our years. And the amount of work that it took to make this simple figure here is, is so unbelievable. So each one of these dots here represents a year of field work for somebody. And these are all our years here. So we did a lot of work in terms of making up this figure here. And what this shows you is that from the 1850s to the present time, when plants are flowering in the spring, and again, each one of these symbols here represents the average flowering time for 30 
common wildflower species that each of us saw in every year. So plants like hybrid blueberry, marsh marigold, columbines, etc. And what you can see here is that in Thoreau's years, there's a lot of variation, but on average, plants are flowering around May 16th. In Hosmer's years, plants are varying, but they flower around May 11th. And in our years, the plants are flowering around May 6th. So even though if you go to Concord today, it looks undeveloped, it looks like very natural, it looks sort of very, like a very typical colonial New England town, in fact, the plants there are responding to climate change. It's now about two degrees centigrade, or about four degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than in Thoreau's time, and the plants are responding to this by flowering earlier. So plants are flowering about 10 days earlier now than in Thoreau's time. And they're flowering early because of warming temperatures. And we know this because if you look at, for example, these years right here, this is 2010 and 2012, and those were the warmest springs ever on record in Concord. So these were astonishingly early months of March and April, and the plants responded to those warming temperatures by flowering incredibly early. And it's really temperature which are driving these earlier flowering times. It's not changing rainfall patterns or changing land use patterns. It's not anything except temperature. These plants are responding to temperature and flowering earlier. The other thing which is really different from our research group from a lot of others is that we are always trying to tell the public about the story of climate change. So every time we gather a few more years of data, we always write a scientific article describing our results, and we always write a press release. So that's something that a lot of scientists don't do, but we always write a press release and we pitch it to journalists. And so this has been repeatedly covered in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, and National Public Radio. So the public is aware of the effects of climate change in Concord using the records of Thoreau. We also try to find other ways of telling the story of climate change. And we do have done a lot of work at the Arnold Arboretum, uh, also in Boston. This is an arboretum owned by Harvard. And they haven't kept track of when plants flower on their grounds through careful observations. But what they do have is they have an enormous collection of museum specimens, which are called herbarium specimens. And these herbarium specimens collected on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum are mostly collected when the plants are in full flower. And they have 100,000 of these herbarium specimens. And what we are able to do is to match these museum specimens with when the same plants are flowering on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum today. And so this particular specimen, which was collected on May 19, 1938, was collected from this same Vasey eyes azalea. And so what we do is we go to the same plants today and we see when they're in flower, and we match these observations of flowering today with when they flowered in the past using museum specimens. So this photograph was taken on May 3rd, 2010. And so when this photograph was taken of this plant in full flower, it's about two weeks earlier than it flowered in the past. And by looking at hundreds of these herbarium specimens and matching with hundreds of modern observations, we can again see the plants are flowering earlier at the, at the Arnold Arboretum. I also want to point out that this is the most beautiful plant at the Arnold Arboretum, in my opinion. I think it's a gorgeous plant. And we've taken probably like 500 versions of this photograph. So we take lots of photographs, and so whenever journalists come to see us about our story of climate change, we can give them these great photographs. And they're more likely to write the story about our research than somebody else's, because we have great photographs to give them. So Thoreau also observed when trees were leafing out in Concord, and uh, <coughs> trees are leafing out now about two weeks earlier now than they did at Thoreau's time. And we've done that by matching his observations against our observations. And they actually seem to be responding a little bit more strongly than the wildflowers to climate change. And this kind of makes sense because the trees have their branches in the air, and they're more responsive to air temperature, but the, in the ground, it takes a lot longer for the ground to warm up in the spring, and so the wildflowers don't start responding to climate change as quickly. We've also been doing a lot of experiments with trees, trying to figure out how trees know when it's spring. And you can actually do very simple experiments to investigate how trees know when the spring is. And these very simple experiments hadn't really been done before with North American trees. And these very simple experiments involve 
clipping dormant twigs in the months of January, February, March, and April, and then bringing them inside and putting them either under lights or in the dark, and then seeing whether they leaf out or not, how long they take to leaf out. And we know that trees generally have respond to three different things. They have to go through a winter chilling period. They have to go through a certain number of periods of cold weather. Then they have to be exposed to warm temperatures in the spring, called a spring warming requirement. And then they also have to be exposed to, a, to lengthening days in the spring, a photo period requirement. But exactly what the balance of these requirements are hadn't been worked out for North American trees. And as expected, we find that New England trees tend to be very conservative, just like the people. So they tend to be not very responsive. They have to go through a long winter before they respond to warming temperatures. And this is in contrast to a lot of the invasive shrubs. So for example, you have barberries and, and honeysuckles and bittersweets and a lot of other invasive woody plants on the ground. And these invasive plants tend to have a much lower winter chilling requirement meaning that they can take advantage of warm temperatures in the spring much more quickly and start reaching out. Another way to tell the story of climate change we found also is by looking at historical collections of photographs. So New England is very rich in historical materials, particularly historical photographs, and we find that some of these photograph collections can be very useful for investigating climate change. And this was a an example of a particular photograph collection that we came across. We, we met a woman who collects photographs taken from historically important cemeteries on Memorial Day. So she has a very specialized collection. And she said that in her whole collection, she had one photograph that looked really different. So she had a collection of, of this, she had, she had a photograph taken from the Lowell Cemetery in Lowell, Massachusetts, and it was taken on May 30th, 1868, shortly after the Civil War. And, she, and this photograph looks really different. And what, what is really strange about this photograph? No leaves. And so of all the collections of all the photographs from her collection on Memorial Day, it's the only one in which the trees don't have leaves. And this photograph on the right is my attempt to try to take as close a picture I could at the same kind of angle in the same scene. I couldn't take it exactly. This is now a building where the person was standing when they took that picture before. But this is pretty close. And you can see there's a lot of, um, that the trees are all fully leafed out. And so when you actually go back and look at the weather records, you discover that 1868 was one of the years with no spring. So it was a year in which there were freezing temperatures in March, April, May, and even into June. There were temperatures even in the 20s in the month of June. So either the trees didn't leaf out, or they started to leaf out and the leaves were killed by frost. In, in Thoreau's time, in the middle of the 19th century, this was the end of the time called the Little Ice Age. And people were concerned that the temperature was just a little bit colder than it was then, that, that agriculture would completely fail, that people wouldn't grow crops in the summer, and that also they would freeze in the wintertime. They would run out of firewood. And we're in a very opposite situation right now, where the climate has gotten warmer, and people are concerned that if the temperature gets a little bit warmer, even two to three degrees centigrade warmer than it is now, that the world civilization might fail because of rising sea levels, drought, and the failure of agriculture. We're also very concerned with how climate change is affecting birds in this area, and that this is a surprisingly large amount of information about how climate change, about, about bird arrival times in the spring. And so what we were concerned with was, are birds arriving earlier in the spring now? Are they responding in a way which is similar to plants? And what we find is that birds are arriving a couple of days earlier. Some birds are arriving a couple of days earlier now than they did in the past. So birds that are overwintering in the mid-Atlantic states or in the southern, southeast United States are coming a couple of days earlier or maybe a week earlier now than in the past. So they're responding, but not as much as the plants. But the birds that are coming from Central America, all these warblers and flycatchers that are coming from Central America or South America, they're really not changing their arrival time very much. And the reason is that because when they're in South America or Central America, they don't know what the weather is like here. And also, they don't fly only in response to temperature. They don't fly if it's rainy, they don't fly if there are headwinds. And so there's a lot more variability in terms of when they arrive in the spring. And so it seems that the birds are not 
responding to climate change in the same way that the plants are. And what is really connecting the birds and the plants are the insects. Because when the birds arrive in the spring, they feed on insects. And when insects emerge in the spring, they're feeding on plants. So insects are really the connecting links. And so we began to search for how climate change is affecting the insects of this region. And we found that it was very difficult to find information. That lots of people gather information about plants, lots of people gather information about birds, but surprisingly few people made careful studies of insects. But eventually we connected with the Massachusetts Butterfly Club, and we found that they had a huge amount of information going back to the 1980s. And if you would be able to analyze their records, what we found is that butterflies, like elephants and hair streaks, that they are very responsive to climate change. They come out early in warm springs, and they come out late in, in very cold springs. And also, there were other studies that came out around the same time with bees, again, finding that bees are very responsive to climate change. And so there we find some potential for what's called an ecological mismatch, that if the Plants and the insects are responding strongly to climate change, and they're shifting much earlier, but the birds aren't shifting, that maybe when the birds come in the spring, they'll miss these big early pulses of insects, and they won't have enough food to feed themselves or to feed their nestlings. And so maybe this is a cause of why birds are declining, this possibility of an ecological mismatch. It turns out we don't have very much evidence for this, but it's something that, that people are investigating very actively. Another thing that I want to mention is that every time you go in and do a lot of field work, that you discover something new and something different. And when we started to investigate flowering time of plants in Concord, we found that there were so many species that Thoreau and Hosmer had recorded the flowering time of that we couldn't find. And so this became a major secondary objective of our research in Concord as botanists. We started to search for these missing wildflower species. And so we asked local residents where we could find these plants. We started looking for old herbarium specimens to see where they'd been collected in Concord. And we went and searched very aggressively to try to find these missing wildflower species. And eventually, we could find some of them, but a lot of them we couldn't find. And eventually, we concluded that about 27% of the wildflower species that Thoreau and other botanists had seen in Concord were no longer present. And about 35% of the species had declined dramatically in abundance. And this is very surprising if you go to Concord today, because Concord is a very well-protected landscape. About 35% of it is strictly protected, and about another 35% of it is undeveloped. So most of the town is still in pretty good condition, and yet we have all these missing wildflowers. And we don't, and it's probably a lot of different factors which are causing this decline. So it's residential neighborhoods, habitat fragmentation, rising deer populations, air pollution, water pollution, invasive species. But at least some of the decline in wildflower species is caused by climate change. And we know this because the species which have been lost are disproportionately the cold loving northern species. And the species which are increasing in abundance are the warm, loving northern species. And this is also true of the birds and the butterflies. So we see a lot of southern butterfly species arriving in Massachusetts that historically had occurred only further south. We see a lot of southern bird species extending their range into New England. And so we see the effects of climate change not only on the timing of events, but also on the changing abundance of species and the distribution of species. So these changes are going to continue in the future also. So if we look at the changing climate of the world, so if we, here we are in, in 2019, the temperatures have already risen globally by about one degree centigrade, or about two degrees Fahrenheit. So we're at this point right here. And you know, if I was giving this talk about five years ago, I would say that we're probably closer on track to this future scenario of about a two degree centigrade increase in temperature. But with the increased economic development in the world and with the United States pulling out of climate change treaties, we're probably closer on track to this three degree centigrade increase in temperature by the end of this century. And this is a very frightening scenario. It's, it really is going to result in huge consequences for places like Wells, Maine, in terms of rising sea levels, rising temperatures, uh, ocean acidification. 
But what does that mean generally for the climate? So if we look at Massachusetts, so when I was growing up, like you know, as a child, as a young man in the 50s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, Massachusetts had a climate like, like Massachusetts. But Massachusetts no longer has a climate like Massachusetts. So Massachusetts now has a climate like New Jersey had when I was growing up. And by the end of this century, Massachusetts will have a climate like North Carolina had when I was growing up. And if you look at Maine here, so Maine, okay, so Maine up here, so Maine is also going to be shifting down. So Maine will probably have a climate like, say, Virginia did when, when many of you were growing up. So Maine, the climate of Maine is also going to be changing. And so again, Massachusetts is not going to be a great place to protect a lot of the endangered wildflowers that we presently have. So a lot of our endangered wildflowers and our endangered animals in Massachusetts are species that need a certain climate. And they will probably continue to decline as the climate gets warmer in Massachusetts. But interestingly enough, in North Carolina, is a species, is, in, North, in North Carolina, is the one place in the world where the Venus flytrap lives. And this spot in North Carolina where the Venus flytrap lives, by the end of the century, is probably going to be too hot and too dry for the Venus flytrap. So what's going to be the best place for the Venus flytrap in the United States? Maine, or, or Massachusetts, Massachusetts or Maine. Probably coastal Maine or Massachusetts will be a great place for the Venus flytrap in the future. It'll be warmer and, well, probably warmer here and wetter here, but it'll be a very good place along these sort of coastal areas of Massachusetts and Maine. So sandy, coastal, rocky areas are probably going to be good places for the Venus flytrap. So it's a happy thought for the future that you're going to be able to grow great plants like the Venus flytrap I'm just outside, outside your door. So in terms of the future of what, what we're doing in our research group, so for a long time we really focused on the easy pickings of spring theology. But then we realized that climate change is going to be affecting all seasons of the year. So in the winter time, it's going to be meaning less snow cover. <clears throat> it means that you're going to have deeper, harder frosts in the ground with a lot of damage to trees and wildflowers. Uh, it means the summertime is going to be drought, and a lot of wetlands are going to be drying out in the summertime when it's hotter and drier. But one area where we actually have a lot of potential for doing research is in the autumn, because in the autumn, we're going to be having warmer temperatures longer in the fall, and so trees will keep their green leaves longer in the autumn. Uh, birds will stay around a lot longer before they migrate south. And butterflies will be able to fly longer in, in the autumn before getting killed off or before going into dormancy. And so we've been increasingly documenting the effects of climate change on the autumn time of the year. And one of the more interesting connections, which has actually been very relevant to this property here, is if you actually look at a lot of the invasive plants on the grounds here of your reserve, I mean, a lot of them are species that have berries that are eaten by birds, like Japanese barberry, uh, bittersweet, multi or the, the honeysuckles. And what we think is happening is that a lot of birds are now staying around over the winter time that used to migrate south. So do you have overwintering robins here? OK, so overwintering robins. So overwintering robins, one of the reasons that they're able to stay here during the winter time is because they're eating the fruits of these invasive species. And so one of the reasons why invasive species are probably more common is because birds are staying in the wintertime eating those fruits and then dispersing them. And so it's this connection between birds overwintering here that didn't used to overwinter in this area and the rise of invasive species. And this is something that, that we're investigating of this topic of fruit epidemiology. The other thing which I'm very interested in is looking at unusual events, weather events, and using these unusual weather events to tell the story of climate change. And two years ago, in the Boston area, we had the most severe summer drought and heat wave that we'd ever recorded. I think it didn't extend as far as Maine, but it probably had somewhat dry and hot weather. But in Boston, it was very, very extreme. We actually had three months in which there was virtually no rain, and in which the temperatures broke records uh, in, in, uh, in late July, August, September, and through October. And this was remarkable in terms of its impact on the biology. So we had 
crops like corn that just died in the field as they weren't irrigated. We had trees in which the leaves turned yellow and fell in August. And also we had a complete movement of migratory birds out of the eastern Massachusetts area. They just all left early. And resident birds like this woodpecker were kind of desperately feeding on hummingbird feeders just to get a little bit of moisture. And so this is a way of telling the story of climate change because even though this region is not predicted to have summer drought, it helps people in New England appreciate what people in California, for example, or the American Southwest or Texas are going to be experiencing because of climate change. So those areas will, will, are predicted to have higher temperatures and lower rainfall. And so an event like this helps us to appreciate the extreme events that they're having. And then the other thing which uh, is very important to me is besides publishing the research is telling people about the effects of climate change. And so uh, here I am um, in the upper, in the, on the left, telling the story of climate change to French television. I'm trying to be very dramatic because I imagine French people to be kind of more dramatic and emotional than Americans. So I'm waving my candle on and jumping up and down, telling the story of climate change while uh, standing next to Great Meadows Wildlife Sanctuary. And here I am talking to a group of first and second graders in Lincoln, Massachusetts, and trying to explain it to them in kind of terms that, that they can understand. And I think that we have a responsibility, whether we're in universities, whether we're scientists, or sort of members of the public, to get involved in this issue of climate change. And I know that many of you are involved in that through monitoring of phenology on the grounds here. And this is something that, that really everyone can do through these citizen science programs. So if you just simply keep your eyes open, you can observe climate change. You can do it through organizations uh, like the, the sanctuary here, but you can also do it through organizations like eBird, which, in which you can record bird observations in the spring, or iNaturalist, or Project Budburst, or the National Phenology Network. There's lots of, of ways in which people can make observations and contribute to large citizen science networks that allow people to document the effects of climate change. Or you can even do this just as simply as recording when the forsythias or the lilacs or the apple tree flower around your home. And if you just do this for many years, if you encourage your children to do it and grandchildren <coughs> to do it, it's a way also of documenting the effects of climate change. So for me, I didn't try to connect climate change to Thoreau. So I've read, through, I've read the book Walden probably you know, 30 times in the last 15 years. I read it at least once a year and sometimes several times a year. And when I read the book Walden by Thoreau, I can see, I read it as a manual of how to deal with the problem of climate change. And so when I read Walden, I get three clear messages out of it. One message is to observe nature. You go out and observe nature, and if you see nature, if you observe nature, not only are you enriching your own life, but you will observe the effects of climate change. And especially in a place like this, if you go and you measure the sea level, if you record phenology, if you record when birds are arriving in the spring in a nature sanctuary like this or just in this coastal area, you will see the effects of climate change in just a few years. You will still be a very early year uh, in which you will see surprising events taking place right in front of you. The second message that I get out of Walden is to live simply. So Thoreau advocated people to live simply because you would be healthier, you would have less worries in your life, and you also not have to work so hard. So you'd be able to really do the important things in your life rather than being a slave to money. But also this message of living simply is really the message of how to deal with the problem of climate change. Because if all of us had smaller cars or public transportation, if we took less plane flights, if we lived in smaller homes, if we didn't have to heat our homes as much in the wintertime and kept, we didn't have to put on the air conditioning as much in the summertime, if we had a vegetarian diet, so if we took all these simple steps, then we would use less energy ourselves. So it's a, way, it's a way of modeling ourselves and as a society for using less energy and producing less carbon dioxide. But the third important point that I get out of Walden is the need to be involved politically. So Thoreau was very involved. People sometimes portray him as a hermit, but he actually wasn't a hermit. He was actually a very social person. He had many friends. He, he was involved in political issues of his time, and he wrote very actively, and he spoke very actively on the issues of his times, which were the problems of slavery and the problems of war. And 
Right now, we have this great problem facing society, this problem of climate change. And if Thoreau was alive today, he would tell us, you know, you should change your own life, but the only way the problem is really going to be changed is if our government really takes action. It's really not just individuals and towns and cities. We, we need level action at those levels also. We need individuals and towns and cities to be credible, but the only way ultimately we're going to be able to deal with this problem is if it's a national cause and the United States government makes agreements with the government of China and the other major industrial powers of the world. So we really need to work, work together. And in my case, I took all of these ideas which I've talked about today and put them into my book, Walden Warming. And this is my opportunity to tell the story the way I think it should be told. And with that, I quit. And thank you very much for your attention. Who is the Thoreau scholar who gave you uh, access to the records of Thoreau's? His, his name was Brad Dean. So Brad Dean was also the editor of Thoreau's unpublished volume of um, Seeds and um, also Freedom Time. So Thoreau's, Brad Dean was a great scholar. He's actually kind of an example of you know, someone who just loved Thoreau and dedicated his delight to Thoreau and was not a very practical person in terms of finding a regular job. Uh, but just sort of, you know, just was doing everything on Thoreau and about where every Thoreau manuscript was and had copies of them and uh, wasn't that kind of about copyrights and whether he had the right to copy these things or not. He just basically loved Thoreau and accumulated all this stuff. Thank you. Yes? Um, so what are some steps that we can take to affect change? Government? Well, the big changes, government Well, the things that we can do, I mean, first of all, to act as individuals. So, I mean, so if you believe in climate change, start taking actions yourself. So for example, whatever car you have by a more fuel efficient car, or whatever you normally keep the temperature in your house, keep it you know, kind of lower in the winter and, and higher in the summer, and eat a more simple diet, I mean, eat less meat. But also it means to organize in your communities. So whether it's in this town here or the state of Maine, to get involved in that issue, it seems to be Local initiatives seem to be very important right now because the government is so intransigent on the subject. But the other thing is to be involved in political parties, to not withdraw. So Thoreau didn't with, withdraw from society. I mean, he was very, very actively involved in making strong statements to the government, taking very strong political stands. And so I think that that's one thing we need to do is to be involved in the political process, to be involved with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and to be involved um, in other national organizations. And you can also make international connections. I mean, you can be involved in international organizations, too. Yes? I'm not hoping for a mismatch, but I'm wondering, is there, and do you have any evidence these days of where you think there could be an example of a local mismatch that we could talk about? Right, so that's, 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 that's a great question. This is a, this is a really active subject, and something that that the public is very interested in, and journalists are very interested in the subject of mismatch. And the mismatch that people always thought would be happening is maybe between birds and insects. The challenge with that is that birds are very adept at changing their food. So birds, you know, depending when they arrive in the spring, some insects are more abundant in one year, or other insects are abundant in different years. And so birds are very kind of very skillful at changing what insects they're feeding on, even changing their feeding behavior. So it's actually very hard to study ecological mismatches in birds. What we think is actually a very promising subject for this is the mismatch between trees and wildflowers. Because what we've seen in concrete is that the uh, trees have shifted by about uh, two to three weeks earlier leafing out now than the past. But the wildflowers have only changed by about one to two weeks. So the trees are, are changing faster in terms of their leafing out time than the wildflowers are changing their leafing out time and flowering in the spring. And generally, the wildflowers leaf out about two weeks before the trees in Concord. They leaf out about two weeks before the trees. And so in about, for about two weeks, the wildflowers are in full sun in the spring. And that two weeks, it turns out, is extremely important for them to make up their energy budget for the year. 
But that period of several weeks of full sunlight is getting shorter since the rose time, and we predict it will be even shorter in the future. So we can imagine at some point, you know, 50 years from now, the wildflowers will be leafing out right at the same time as the trees are leafing out, and the, the wildflowers won't get full sunlight, and that means they won't have enough energy to mature their fruits a few weeks or a few months later. And they won't have enough energy to make flowers for the next year. And so we think that a lot of the wildflowers in our region might be facing severe problems because of an ecological mismatch with trees. Yes? A comment, not a question, but that sounds to me like the vacation season has expanded up here and yet college kids go back to school and leave a lot of the restaurants and hotels without labor in September in October, which didn't used to happen because people would leave before Labor Day. But um, uh, my question is on the autumnal uh, phenology. When birds leave, are there mismatches to the south at all, or is it because it's equatorial, it's always the same down there? Are there any cycles down there that they might miss? We don't really know about that. I think that's kind of a great question. I mean, it kind of makes me think about it. I'm not really sure what the answer is. Uh, but of course, as the, as the animals go further south, the weather tends to be more equitable, and so there might be some effect, but I'm not sure what it was. Of course, a big problem further south is a lot of habitat destruction uh, in, in tropical areas in the Caribbean and Central America. A lot of areas that used to be forests are now being converted to plantations and, and um, farms, so that, that's a problem. One of the reasons that birds in the past would have left here in early in the, in the autumn is because of the danger of frost. And so as that danger gets less, the birds are tending to stay later. So there's a much more kind of a, kind of a hard um, kind of reason for them to leave this area. And similarly, when birds arrive in the spring, birds didn't arrive very early in the spring here because if they arrived too early in the spring, they would be, they would be killed by the frost and there'd be nothing for them to eat. But now they can come a little bit earlier because it's warmer and there's Thanks for leaving out. Yes? How much is the uh, record on insects being augmented now? Is it, is it now a, a fairly large area of study that is coming up? Or well, that's a very, very interesting question. So, I mean, if, if, if you'd ask me that question about, um, say, five years ago, or even like three years ago, I would have said that you know it's, it's pretty hard to find insect data, and when one really struggles to find that, there's a few places in the world where people really monitor insects very carefully, mostly England. So England has these kind of amazing studies where people are monitoring phenology in some areas of France and Germany, not so much in the United States. But starting about a year ago, there have been reports of dramatic insect declines uh, in the United States and in, uh, in, in Europe especially, that insects have declined precipitously. And so because of this, there's been this unbelievable level of activity over the last six months in the entomological community, where entomologists all over the United States and Europe in particular, but in other areas of the world, are just digging into old data files and looking for old insect studies, rediscovering kind of forgotten insect studies, and then are presently restudying them. And this is an incredibly active area of research right now in the scientific community of people seeing whether insects are declining or not. The general consensus is actually very interesting that a lot of the very preliminary reports of insect decline seem to have not been very well done. So a lot of the studies of insect decline are very problematic, but enough study, some of the studies, in fact, do show insects have declined. So it, it's, it's one of these interesting situations where the data is problematic so far, but the general pattern seems to be that insects are declining. Yes? You mentioned that um, some of the wildflowers that Thoreau noticed aren't being found anymore. Are there any that we would recognize, any of those species that may have moved north here? or? Well, I think they probably are not moving north so much as, as dying out in a lot of places. And so, for example, in, in Thoreau's time, there were 21 species of orchids that he observed, that he had actually, his contemporaries observed in Concord. And we have, we've only seen seven of them. Mm -hmm. So out of these 21 species, we've only seen seven of them despite intensive searching. And one of them, for example, is the 
purple fringed orchid, which is one of the most beautiful orchids around. And we only saw one individual in one year. So a lot of these orchids have declined. Also, for example, um, lilies are, are used to be very common at this time, like Canada lilies, these big, tall, beautiful lilies with orange flowers. And we've only seen a few lilies in one year. And that seems to be the case of deer, for example, uh, going after these lilies. So there's a lot of decline of, of species. But I'm guessing that, that if, you, if there was historical records of wildflowers on this property, you would find a lot of missing species also. And that's because of invasive species. So actually, I saw one really incredible um, section of forest on the property here, where there was this beautiful sand of red maples, and the entire understory was Japanese barberries. Yeah. I mean, it was really kind of remarkable um, seeing that. And that means that all those wildflower species, which used to occur in that sand, are no longer present. And that's probably a very good place to start thinking about removing those barberries to try to you know, encourage the wildflowers to come back. Do you think the species are just migrating north? Well, the species, actually, they don't know to migrate north. So it's actually kind of, you've actually hit one of my favorite topics, so which is that, I mean, how would species know to migrate north? They're actually migrating in all directions. And the ones that migrate north might be better able to attract the climate. The ones that are migrating south are dying. Well, I, mean, I didn't mean they were like, let's go to Vermont. <laughs> let's, let's go to Vermont. <laughs> let's go to Canada. It's, it's, this right, so, selection, I mean, right, so species are migrating north. So the, the best, the area in the world that has the best biological records is, is the United Kingdom and areas of northern Europe, it's like Scandinavia and Germany. So those areas have unbelievable records of, of the distribution of species. They just record in incredible detail where species are found on, on the, you know, the town or community level. And in those areas, they see very clear documentation that if you look at particular species of plants or butterflies or birds, that at the southern edge of their range, they're declining, and at the northern edge of their range, they're expanding and moving further north. So it's, it's very clear that species are migrating. We have some of these records in the United States, but more for things like birds and butterflies. So again, if you look at, at butterflies, which are very well documented and very mobile, there's a lot of species which are extending their range further north in New England right now. Um, and again, southern species, which we're never seeing in New England, are now extending their range into New England. Mm -hmm. Yes? I, I think, this, for me, the, the slide you showed on the agricultural production is extremely significant. And is being done now to address that. But, you know, in North America, it really looks like, you know, Canada, the production is going to go up very significantly. And, you know, in some ways it already has in terms of, you know, the grains we get from Canada. If you go up there and look at the farming, it's, it's fairly extensive. If you go up in there, Quebec, a lot of Quebec. So, so how might, are there any people looking at adaptation? Well, I think that right, certainly there's a huge effort being made right now to kind of figure out how to adapt agriculture to climate change. And there's some places which are going to do better. So it's right, places like Canada, northern China, um, areas of Russia, I think you're going to have improved agriculture because of warming temperatures. But that's not going to compensate for the decline, the overall decline of agricultural productivity because you're going to have these vast areas of the equators or somewhat drier areas of the United States, like areas like Texas or a lot of the Midwest, it's just going to be kind of too dry. Yeah. People aren't going to be able to, kind of, it's not, not only not going to be enough rainwater, but also the, the aquifers are going to be run dry to compensate for that. So we're going to have huge changes. It's going to cost tens of billions of dollars to, to make these adaptations. And they, excuse me. <coughs> but they still won't compensate for uh, you know, the decline in productivity. So there'll be these few bright spots, but they're overall not going to be able to, you know, compensate. So in New England, we could say, oh, you know, it's kind of great. It's great we're going to be having these um, higher temperatures. It's going to be nicer, you know, especially I grew up in New England. I, I, in the 1960s, the temperatures were a little bit cold in New England. You think, like, it's great, you know, great temperatures are a little bit warmer. But you start thinking through what the implications of that are. So you can't just take one part and not the other. So the higher temperatures, with rising sea levels, which are going to cause massive coastal flooding. 
It's going to happen with ocean acidification, which is going to damage seafood and, and ocean ecology. Higher temperatures mean more disease outbreaks. And a lot of our trees are very vulnerable to both native pest insects and introduced in insects. And so things like emerald ash borer, woolly adelgid, these are all going to be extending further into Maine, killing hemlock trees, ash trees, maple trees. And so there are really serious consequences. And also, um, a lot of our cities and towns are not adapted to heat waves. So in, when I was growing up in Newton, Massachusetts, you know, people said we don't need air conditioning in Boston because it always cools down at night. But last summer, it didn't cool down at night. We actually had several weeks in which the temperatures were in the 90s during the day and went into the 80s, mid to high 80s at night. And you couldn't live in houses with a point which, let's say, you could, you could live in houses without air conditioning, but you won't be comfortable without air conditioning. I mean, we, you absolutely needed air conditioning to survive comfortably in that, in that environment. And so increasingly, people are always building air conditioning in their homes. But a lot of homes in Maine don't have air conditioning. And when these high temperatures come, people have, are very uncomfortable. And also people who are elderly, people who are having uh, serious illnesses, will often become more sick or even die because of these heat waves. So it's very serious in terms of a public health issue also. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm a journalist, so this is selfish. But you're really savvy about storytelling. And I'm always curious about what kinds of stories, either the way you shape, the way you tell people about your clients, uh, do you find to be particularly effective at actually changing people's minds, if any? And what are the stories that aren't being Well, I think, I mean, certainly, I mean, there's a huge deal, you know, just the amount of stuff which is being written about climate change is just enormous. I mean, it's, it's just quite incredible. Um, so I think lots of stories are being told. Um, I, think, I think the story which isn't told enough is the fact that the people think that they can adapt to climate change without, without pain. That there are all these kind of you know high tech ways of dealing with climate change. Um, you know, you can buy a Prius. You know, you can um, you know you can pay someone in the Midwest to have a wind farm, and then you can keep doing what you want to do. Uh, that you can allow coal fired plants to keep burning coal if they you know if they if they bought something in a cap and trade scheme. And I think that, that at some point people have to realize that the problems of climate change are so serious that that it really involves a society reinventing itself. It involves people making major changes with both voluntarily and also with government mandates. And that if we don't do that, then the world is really going to stop functioning uh, within a century. And so I think that that's, that's the truth which really isn't told enough in which people don't appreciate enough. They keep thinking you can make these high-tech changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that we could reduce, uh, we could reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we're producing by by probably 30 or 50 percent, that people were willing to undergo radical change to their lifestyle, but but you know no one's really proposing that. It seems too incredible. It seems too unbelievable. It's almost an early adopter to do it. Let's say. Yeah. yeah. Well, you yeah, right. I mean, I think, I, right. So there's some people who are doing it, and people think that they're kind of strange, but I think that they're really kind of ahead of the curve. Yeah. Um, no, but we don't need very much meat. I mean, certainly, yeah, I mean, certainly if you look at the, at the numbers, I mean, you know, vegetarian diets are, are, there's so many reasons to do it. I mean, so many reasons to be a vegetarian. I mean, save money, better health, but also you're saving the planet because, I mean, a pound of protein, a pound of beef, you know, takes like dozens of times more water and energy. Uh, so, I mean, there's really a lot of reasons feeding either vegetable protein or eating, for example, fish. I heard you or, or, I should say fish, small oh. fish, eating minnows or sardines, <laughs> not, not minnows, but eating sardines or, or anchovies. Uh, I heard you speak in Concord at the UU Church many years okay. ago, and I actually moderated the Q&A session. Okay. But um, Concord became a real example of a community that really embraced environmentalism because I was part of that early movement there, and it started relatively slowly. And then it took off so that it, it really got to the municipal level. And, 
And it was interesting to see that change occur because at first it wasn't easy, but then the, the, uh, the town really started to adopt it and there were people that went to public meetings and um, the farming picked up in town, the local food movement, um, you know, the, the landfill became a giant uh, uh, solar electric field. Um, and it's interesting to see now when I go back there and, you know, talk to those people, you know, who, who were at the beginning. Um, but it, it was amazing where it occurred. It was, you know, in the churches. It was in the um, uh, through town government, different aspects of it, and energy committee created. So, um, and I don't know overall what the impact on the town, the town level was, but there were definitely people there that really started to embrace it. Right, right, so Pumpkin is, Pumpkin is a really a, a amazing place because it's a place where there's such a very high intellectual level, it's a very high level of idealism, but probably the more, the more radical solution to in a place like Concord is to tell people that if you really want to deal with problems of the environment and problems of climate change, that the people should be, instead of focusing on Instead of everyone having these very large houses and, and large properties with all these things in it and driving their Priuses and other cars around, that, that the whole focus of the community should be on a very high intellectual level and cultural level of the town. And that's what people should be putting their energy on. And that they don't need these big houses and these big televisions and, and you know, other, other material possessions. That would be an even more radical idea. And so, you know, people could just take their big houses and kind of mothball them and just live in, you know, one, one or two small rooms and eat the most simple diet and, that, and, and have all public transportation, have no private cars in Concord. Yeah. I and mean, that would be an even more radical solution. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, one thing that they've done in Concord, I think they've banned, they banned plastic water bottles. Yes. And I, I mean, I mean, plant banning plastic water bottles is kind of a good step, but it's really kind of a, you know, it's, it's really a, a token, it's really a symbol. But for example, if they ban private cars in Concord, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they ban meat in Concord, if, yeah. they, if, they, if they ban air conditioning in Concord, I mean, that would be even more exciting. Yeah. Right, 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 right,